so what the differences are in living in the Netherlands compared to in the States, I'd say one of the things that hit me most, one of the first things, um, one of the, is that the idea of, I guess, space is what makes the biggest difference. Uh, the Netherlands is very small. I'm, I can, it's about a quarter the size of the state of Washington, which is, I think, less than that because in the state of Utah. And it, they, the American mentality, especially in a lot of states where it's, you know, you have your land and you have your area and it's all very, not necessarily secluded, but separate. Uh, whereas in the Netherlands, they're very used to sharing space. That, and that's just, it's a cool, I'd say because of the geographic influence, it influences the culture, just how they live and interact with each other. Um, they're, you know, they're used to the fact that their house is shares a wall with this house and this side shares a wall with this house and that's very common there are some freestanding houses but the majority of the people live you know they live in the cities they share space you know they don't have much of a yard it's just a lot smaller but that's normal for them um also distances you know if we want to go anywhere basically we drive a car most of the time for the majority of people uh, especially out in the in the west i'd say uh but in the netherlands there's a ton of biking and a ton of walking as well. People also have cars, but it's very common if you want to go shopping, you jump on your bike and they have like saddlebags on the sides, basically. And you know, they'll fill they'll go there and they'll shop for three or four days worth of groceries or and then just bring it home on their bike. And just that mentality of I mean, you know, of transportation and, and just ha it, yeah, makes a difference. Transportation on top of you know, just going walking or biking. Uh, they have a really good centralized public transportation system. Trains, buses, metros, trams. Uh, the, you know, you have one card that you can get that has a little electronic chip in it and you load it up with money and it works with pretty much every system. So you can travel from A to B, wherever you want, just checking in and out. Really straightforward, simple, um, and effective. They have got it down when it's i think because it's just smaller it's easier to to manage everything they do a good job with it um industry the netherlands is a because they have a, a lot of open policies and they're also very fluent in english i'd say the vast majority of people i talk to could speak fairly good english at least if not better and the because of that a lot of companies will choose to you know, set up shop or set their headquarters in the Netherlands. So it's popular that way, especially in The Hague, there's a lot of uh, political um, political offices and everything where people come. Uh, and I'm not a pro on all that, but I know that it's popular in that way. The companies will outsource there. When you go shopping there, it's kind of your job to get most everything done. Where, for example, you bring your own bags, you know, they don't most of the stores won't provide you with a bag. If you do, you, you buy each one. They're a little more thrifty that way. Uh, they also, just just with um, customer service and stuff, you, you do a lot more your, yourself, I find. Uh, as for example, if you go to a restaurant, there they don't, they don't do tips like we do here. So it's just, it's just a, di a little bit different mentality of, of, of how that works out. When you, uh, I mentioned earlier about how they'll shop for three or four days or, or less. They, a lot of times their breads and different foods like that, a lot more fresh, less preservatives, so it'll go bad quicker. So they shop more frequently and they buy smaller amounts. Uh, you know, my family, we used to go to town and buy food for weeks, you know, and come back all in the, in the van. But over there, it's just so much smaller. And the, the diet is also just, on average, they eat less, I guess you could say. Then in American portions at restaurants that they serve you less, and that's normal to them. A lot of a lot of members and people I talked to that had been to the states, they always commented on how how huge all the portion size was. You know, like, I went to get a drink at McDonald's and it was gigantic, <laughs> and it's just it's just the difference in the way it's developed. It's just not normal there to have huge portion sizes, and, you know, comparatively. Rotterdam, um, I served there for about. I had to think. I think it was there for four transfers, or three and a half, I guess. Um, that's about, that's almost six months. It's close to it. Um, but life there was, it's pretty crazy. That was like, that was a really big city, but it was cool. It has probably some of the best public transportation I've ever been on. 
just like the tram. You, if you can't catch a tram on time, you can grab a bus. And if you can't catch either one of those, then you can run and catch a metro and you can be wherever it is you're going within, you know, half an hour at most. Um, it's a, that's one of the most international cities in the Netherlands too, if I'm not mistaken. And there's, there's a lot of different people there. Um, in the Rotterdam North Ward, because there's actually technically two parts of Rotterdam. There's the north and the south. But the north is where I served, and that's kind of the more industrial part of the city where that's where all the businesses are and all the, like, that's kind of where it all goes down, really. Um, but in the Rotterdam North Ward, they actually have a Portuguese-speaking branch, too, because there's a lot of um, people that have immigrated there from Angola or Portugal or all these other different cities or all these other different countries. And so it's kind of interesting to see the fact that, you know, I'm serving in the Netherlands with mostly Dutch people, but at the same sense, all of a sudden I go to this area where there's all these other different cultures that are just opening up my view to how different people live and their different ideas and all that. Um, most of the shopping, we always rode our bikes. <laughs> just ride our bikes and you had these big like plastic bags that you'd put on the back rack and steer with one hand and bike home. Um, that was always an adventure. <laughs> but uh, um, some other things about living there, it was just most of the time you'd run into like business people, which meant one of the greatest lessons I learned from that was there's so many people we talked to that were just, they were hurrying along their way and all that, and I'm, I'm sure they lived there, so it was more just kind of like a habit, like I just live in Rotterdam. But to me, it was just so interesting to me. Like Rotterdam, the part that I served in, was actually completely and totally annihilated during World War II, which makes it one of the most modern cities in the Netherlands because it's been rebuilt over the years and built from the ground up. And they actually have, um, in that, they have a like markers of the border of where like the city was actually just completely and totally leveled and one of one of the interesting things to me that just kind of strengthens my testimony of there's no such thing as coincidence and God has to exist is that border the church sits right here and that border goes right, right along where the church sits so it was just like just barely away from the church that all that area was completely and totally leveled during World War II and that's just something that I've always been very impressed by. Huh. Rotterdam was probably the first area that I ever made sure I was home by 9 o'clock. <laughs> it's, it's generally not a good idea to stay out late. Um, or to, to be home late, I guess is the best way to put it. It can be kind of scary in some areas. Um, the public safety there, though, is very, very top-notch. And the policemen know what they're doing and they know how to keep citizens safe. Uh, cost of living is kind of interesting because you can, from what I could tell, I didn't really know the figures and all that too much, but from what I could tell, you could find apartments there that, you know, you're only paying, you know, three, four hundred euros a month and you could get the government's help on and all that to apartments that you're paying two thousand euros a month, which is about the equivalent to three thousand dollars a month, <laughs> you know, and so it, I guess it kind of depends on the person, but everything there is just so close that there's not really... There's not really houses, it's more just like a big line of buildings that have been cut down by walls, or just kind of split up by walls that have been transformed into housing. Just because everything's so compact there, you won't find a whole lot of houses that are just out in the middle of nowhere, unless you're like out in the farms. Be careful when you're biking and make sure your brakes work. I, I had an interesting experience where I tried biking without brakes and <laughs> it was about as close to a near-death experience as I ever wanted to get, especially in a city like that because everything's so busy. But just be careful out there. <laughs> so my first city was Antwerp in Belgium. And the city of Antwerp is very busy. Um, constantly cars and and trams and and bikes all over the place it's just a constant motion of people and it's very it's very old um, Belgium in comparison to Holland first of all is is very old it's still cobblestone it's still you know buildings that are out of brick you know right from you can still tell that these were buildings around in the early 1900s and um, or even older, you know, and um, with castles and it's just, you just feel like you're walking down a scene in a history movie with 
the brick buildings and all the old signs and um and so that's it's just a special feeling in in belgium um and so antwerpa again is is kind of a hot spot for a lot of um a lot of immigrants and so there's a lot of people kind of in that in between stage trying to get out of their old country trying to get into this new one and um and so there's just a lot a lot of variety of people um Antwerpa is well known for their diamonds. It's kind of a, a diamond capital, um, and that's owned by by the Jewish community. Um, community and the latter, and towards I want to say like the eastern part of of Antwerpa, um, is is very Orthodox Jew. Um, you're, you're sitting on the tram leaving, you know, the central station and you're heading, you know, towards, towards Harmony and, you know, where several of our, several members live and, you know, you go under a tunnel and then you come out and then all you see is, is just, you know, these people walking around and they're all, they all look exactly the same, you know, with their top hats and the curls and the women all look identical and, you just feel like you just entered a completely different, different world. And, and that's the same way all over Antwerp, but there's that area and there's another area where, um, a population of, of Africans live. And so it's very, it's fun to walk around Antwerp and, and to feel like you're living in different worlds and, and meeting so many different people. Um, and so with that being my first city, um, it just kind of was was mind blowing, just trying to learn how to be a missionary, how to how to talk to people, figure out you know systems of of travel and and systems of talking and, and approaching people, and so it was very much like a preschool. I felt you know where you're just learning new things, and and so. Antwerp holds a very a very special place in my heart, being my first city, and um, and and then later in another city, I was back in Belgium, so I got to go back to Antwerp a lot for for exchanges and and other opportunities like that. And so um, Antwerp was was very much like a like a preschool, just trying to figure out how to be a missionary, and um, and and I've met some really incredible people in Antwerp and who who changed my life and who changed the course of of my mission because you know from the beginning there that I learned that you know I'm still me and people need to hear you know who I am and not just you know this robot missionary but that who I am as an individual can reach and touch people and that was that was a very defining moment early on in my mission that kind of set the stage for the rest i finally had the opportunity to train i was super excited i was so really upset that i was i was leaving um but i i was able to go to zutamir and that was my dream city that was the one place that i really wanted to serve um, that is where the temple is. It's a very cute little square temple just on the corner. Um, there's a canal right behind it and a nice, you know, green patch of field. And, and so it's a very small, small temple, but, um, Zutumir translates into Sweet Lake. And so it's the Sweet Lake City. And so a lot of jokes, you know, it's like the Sweet Lake City and then Utah has the Salt Lake City. And um, and so it was just kind of a fun place to be, to to serve where the temple is, to, to bike past it all the time and to talk about it with members and, and with investigators and and they all know you because of the big white, white building. And, and so many people ask, well, can we go inside of it? And you're like, well, if you get baptized, you're more than welcome. <laughs> and, um, 
And so Zero to Mirror is kind of it's kind of an in-between city of like big and small. It's just and so it's not very big, but it's not small at all. And um you know, it is very built up and, and modern and um, malls and, and tall buildings and tall apartments and and then around the temple it's still very old and old buildings and um, just the canals and the bikes and um, there's just a very special feeling around around the temple and um, and having had the opportunity to be a trainer um, I was nervous out of my mind. It was my last transfer, and you would think that, okay, going on your last transfer, you'd feel like you got it under your belt, and you know what you're doing. I had no idea what I was doing, and we were whitewashing, so you're taking over a new city, not knowing anything, and I just was blessed to have had a companion who was ready to go from the beginning. She was a firecracker. She was ready to go and just wanted to learn the language. She, I think, trained me more than I trained her. And and she's out there now just changing the mission, doing so much. And um, and so Zutamir is, is a ward. So there's a, a very good amount of members there. Um, there's also an American or international ward that meets there as well later in the afternoon um, with, you know, ambassadors, embassy, faculty, you know, just people who are working um, in Holland. Um, and so it was very fun to work with with Dutch members, but then it was also very weird to go to a sacrament meeting in English, you know, just a couple hours later. It was just very weird to to hear, you know, the sacrament prayers in English again, and um, and so you kind of got a, a taste of both worlds. It's kind of a good transition city for me going home is I still got my Dutch but then it was kind of easing back into American culture just a little bit um, and uh, and I wish I had more time in Zutamir I was only there for six weeks but um, they are they also are just a people with gold hearts they just want to serve and and they really are very missionary minded um, I think, you know, I'd, I'd served in, in really good areas and in really strong areas. Um, but I think Zutamir was the first area that, that I've truly felt on board with the members, how they initiated the missionary work, that they were bringing people to us, that they were so, it was just such a missionary-minded ward that that was such a, a breath of fresh air and, and such a good start for my, my companion being her first city. And, um, and I just, what I treasure about that transfer in that city is the time that I had with Sister Bybee. She truly taught me a lot and, and truly helped me see the good that I have done and and come to to be okay and and proud of the mission that I served um and and so as I said earlier Heavenly Father really wanted the last six months of my mission to be about me to really kind of have me be the investigator and and that's something that I think a lot of missionaries think is not okay, that they really think that it has to be about everyone else and that everyone else, you know, they have to try and get as many baptisms as possible, teach as many lessons as possible. And, you know, looking back and having a total of, if you know, were to look at numbers and to see the total numbers of lessons I taught with my companions or all these other things that they wouldn't, 
they aren't anything remarkable. They aren't anything that I would want to put on display. Um, but what I would put on display are, are all those little moments, all the different conversations that maybe lasted two minutes to an hour. Um, the Heavenly Father really wants the missionary to go home changed. He wants us to to have become a different person. And and that's what I learned in my last my last area is I saw the difference and I saw that I was a different person and I was a little nervous to go home thinking that my parents and my family wouldn't wouldn't recognize who I was. I think that is a common a common fear of all missionaries when they go home. Um, but I have been forever changed on so many different levels because of my mission. And my last area, I gave it my all. That was probably the hardest transfer that I've worked my, my entire mission. So I wanted to leave it all, all out there. And, and all of a sudden, just this, this, this sudden feeling of, oh no, like it's actually at an end and I, I have to do all of this as much as possible. And, um, and so, I don't know. What I think I just would like to get out and across is that it's not easy being a missionary. It's, it's tough. It's really hard. It's also very rewarding. And, and you're just as much the investigator as the people on the street or who you are teaching. And, and you know, the food I ate, the questionable food I ate, the, the places, you know, we walked and the things that I saw and, and heard and experienced all tie in to who I am now and will tie into how I'd be a wife and a mother and to go on to play a role in who I am for the rest of my life. And on the testimony that I have now is is because of those experiences. And and that's something that my last city, as much as little as I know about the city itself and as little of a relationship I have with the members, um, that was just the cherry on top of knowing that you know I you completed a mission. You didn't go home. You didn't give up, and um, and that that feeling is something that I will forever be grateful for. That I will be so thankful that I just didn't get on the plane early like I wanted to. That you made it to the end because that is something. That is a feeling that there's nothing in comparison to.